All right. Well, this evening we have uh, some interesting topics to explore, looking at Jewish history in the 19th century after the Enlightenment and Emancipation. The title of the session is Anti-Semitism and the 19th Century Rise of the Jews. Uh, this is primarily focused in Western Europe, but some of the dynamics apply in Eastern Europe as well. And next session, we'll be talking about Jewish nationalism, which was more focused uh, in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. Um, so we'll see how it sort of shifts the focus between one and the other looking through the 19th century. Um, but we're talking about this concept of anti-Semitism, and we have to define what we're talking about, because as we'll see, it's a very wide ranging application today. Um, it has its origin in a particular point in time. In fact, all the stories we heard about the uh, hostilities with the Greeks and the Romans, the hostilities with the medieval church, the inquisition and persecution of Jews, uh, that led to the expulsion from Spain. None of those periods used the term anti-Semitism. In fact, the term anti-Semitism was first coined in 1879 by a German journalist named Wilhelm Marr, who at the time was anti-Semitic and proudly claimed the label, though in later years, he actually regretted having coined the term. Uh, he sort of changed his opinions on this, sort of like the woman who founded Mother's Day and then hated how Hallmark took it over and so then she tried to cancel it, but it was too late because everybody loved Mother's Day. Um, you can find out about the history of Mother's Day separately. But in this case, anti-Semitism <coughs> is a term that really took off in Europe in the late 19th century. Um, but we have to remember that when we say anti-Semitism today, it refers to a very wide range of behavior and attitudes. People might tell a joke and we say that's anti-Semitic. There might be vandalism of property, of cemetery, of synagogue, and that's called anti-Semitism. There can be physical violence against Jewish people or people who are thought to be Jewish people. You know, sometimes the Amish actually get it because people think they're Jews. Um, that counts as anti-Semitism. There can be government policy, which has a discriminatory effect against Jews um, or private institutional policy of admissions or who's allowed to be a member and so on. Um, there can be actual physical expulsion from a territory that can be anti-Semitism. And then at its sort of highest level, you've got murder of one, several tens, thousands, even millions of Jews. All of that from jokes to mass murder falls under the umbrella of anti-Semitism. And so it's, it's a very wide range that we're trying to cover with one concept. And we have to sort of have the appropriate responses to what we're dealing with um, that a joke is not necessarily mass murder and may never lead to mass murder. On the other hand, um, the dehumanization that's part of the anti-Semitic approach to Jews can be a necessary precursor to that mass murder. That is, you don't go from zero to Holocaust, you have a progression of dehumanization that, uh, that, covers, that covers ground along the way. We also have to distinguish between the 19th century term of anti-Semitism and historical anti-Judaism. You know, the, uh, the animosity between the Catholic Church and Jewish communities um, was often religious-based, based on uh, belief, on ritual practice, and there was an out. If you converted from Judaism to Catholic Christianity or Eastern Orthodox Christianity, um, you were now part of the Christian community and you didn't have generally an ongoing stigma. At certain times and places, there was a little bit of that, but by and large, once you converted out, that was the end of it because it was anti-Judaism, anti-religious ideas, not anti-Jewishness, anti-ethnic persecution or a racial kind of anti-Semitism. In fact, that term anti-Semitism has a racial component to it because at the time in the late 19th century, they were dividing up the world into the different races of human beings. Uh, and the Semites were thought to be one particular race. Uh, and that's why in Europe, it was thought to be more scientific, more modern to be an anti, I'm not just anti-Jewish, like an old Catholic priest, I'm a modern, liberal, enlightened, scientific anti-Semite, who was opposed to that Semitic race of people. Now, sometimes people will try to use that as an out these days to say, well, the Arab world or individual Arab people can't be anti-Semitic because the Arabs are Semites. Arabic is a Semitic language. That's a semantic discussion because when the Europeans coined the term, there weren't a lot of Arabs running around Europe. The Semites they knew were the Jews. Um, and so 
anti-Semitism has a particular meaning. It's not just anti this language group. It's not like people are going around persecuting the Chaldeans who speak Aramaic because they're Semites. Uh, when it's anti-Semitism, it's talking about Jews as Jewish people, not just as part of a Jewish religion. And our biggest challenge in thinking about anti-Semitism is that people often think of it as a kind of psychosis, a pathology. It's a kind of insanity that has no relationship to reality whatsoever. And you think of examples that we saw historically, like the host desecration, where they would steal the communion wafer and torture it, so Christians thought Jews would do. Or Christians thought that Jews would um, uh, kidnap Christian children and use their blood in making matzah. No Jewish community ever did that. It's a total fantasy. In fact, again, if you know anything about Jewish dietary laws, there's an abhorrence of even animal blood in the food that one eats, let alone human blood. So it was a total paranoia, psychosis, fantasy, or maybe a projection of ongoing debates within the Catholic Church over transubstantiation, the body and the blood, and so on. So maybe anti-Semitism is just craziness, insanity, and the anti-Semites are going to hate us no matter what we do. There's no relationship to reality whatsoever. Another approach to anti-Semitism is to say that maybe it's a skewed view of reality. So maybe there are some data points there. Maybe someone had an individual experience with a Jewish person, and then they created a, uh, a universal distaste for all Jews. Think about Haman and the Purim story, for example. Even though his experience with Mordecai is Mordecai actually standing up for himself, Haman nevertheless decides that all Jews everywhere in the Persian Empire must be wiped out. Um, or you can imagine a few, you know, bad lawyer, banker, whatever experiences you decide, all Jewish bankers, all Jewish lawyers, they're all terrible. I hate all the Jews. So it could be a few experiences that are extended more broadly. And by the way, that happens in other kind of racial animus too, including in racial animus Jews might have towards other groups. It could also be finding a way to blame someone for problems in your life or in society. And so the scapegoat is sometimes based on some reality, as we'll see, but it's blaming them in a way that is irrational. So you, for example, notice a lot of the names of the stock brokerage houses are th names like Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs. And then when you lose your stock portfolio in a market crash, you might decide, well, those Jewish stockbrokers of Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs must have made off with the money, and it must be their fault. They become the blame for this circumstance. And in the end, sometimes the anti-Semites and the Jewish Federation Fundraising Committee agree on the statistics. So the anti-Semite might say, look at this, 30% of the doctors in this city are Jewish. That's terrible. And the Jewish Federation Fundraising Committee might say, wow, 30% of the doctors in this city are Jewish. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that wonderful? Seeing how much we've achieved, how much we give back to society. So it could be the same number, but you could read it in a sinister way or you can read it in a positive achievement way. So it's kind of skewed view of reality, but the numbers, the reality might actually be the same. And sometimes it's even the language you use. So here's a comparison of the sociologist versus the anti-Semite. Jews are very prominent in the movie industry. The Jews run the movie industry. You hear the difference? One is a sociologist noting the fact that a lot of Jewish people are involved in the movie industry. The other is the anti-Semite imagining the Jews as a cabal, as a collective, are dominating this particularly influential media source. So you can take that question of reality and how you skew it in different ways to decide is this anti-Semitism or not. If we have time at the end, I'll show you some examples of a questionnaire that the Anti-Defamation League uses to decide if a person or if an area is anti-Semitic and you have to answer like seven or eight out of the 12 questions they ask. Where if you ask, answer only one or two of them the wrong way, it might not qualify as very anti-Semitic, but if you answered eight or nine of them the anti-Semitic way, then you probably fit in that category. 
Now, I mentioned there was a medieval version of a kind of anti-Semitism, and this took place after the Inquisition, where, or during the Inquisition period, after the expulsion from Spain in 1492, or the forced conversion in Portugal in 1497. And this was a concept called limpieza de sangre, which means the purity of the blood, where they actually continued to discriminate against what they called new Christians, because the old Christians were the ones that had pedigree going back a long way. The new Christians were Jews, who were still being looked upon as foreign, different, other, even after the conversion. So this marks a bit of a shift from the purely anti-Judaism religion version to some kind of Jewishness that carries with you even after you've converted to the other religion. And the modern version often presents as a kind of racial anti-Semitism, imagining a distinct Jewish race along the lines of the Aryans and the Africans and the uh, Asiatic races and so on. Um, or sometimes it's an economic anti-Semitism. Uh, Karl Marx, of all people, has an essay about the Jews and the economy, which is brutally anti-Semitic. Um, and Jews were often blamed for their economic niche as the middleman, which meant they were either the aspiring bourgeoisie, which Marx hated, or the exploiters of the working class, which Marx hated. So uh, seeing the Jew as their economic niche made him somewhat anti-Jewish and even anti-Semitic in his writings. But in the end, many of these versions of modern anti-Semitism continued using the resonance of this religious hatred. Um, by the way, the last known example of a blood libel in Europe that took place was in 1946, post-Holocaust, in a town called Kielce in uh, Poland. But there was also a famous case in 1913 in Russia, just before the First World War, where Mendel Bayliss was put on trial in 1913, accused of having kidnapped a Christian child and killed it for its blood. Um, and this is in 1913 in, uh, in the Tsarist uh, uh, empire. And it's actually, the defense attorney was a, a non-Jew who was himself somewhat anti-Semitic, but he said, this is absurd. This just didn't happen. And, uh, you know, like the Dreyfus defense as well, um, it's non-Jew sometimes saying, this is ridiculous. We're leaving this behind. But there are plenty of people out there who are still inclined to believe it because generations have told them that this is what is done. And that belief is deeply rooted. So the Jew is other, the Jew is foreign, the Jew is evil or devilish becomes a racialized version acceptable for a more secular society in the 19th century, but it has its roots in the earlier anti-religious animus. Now, what's happening to Jews during this 19th century that may provide some fodder for anti-Semites and their skewed view of reality? Well, keep in mind the 19th century was a century both of wondrous advancement and of terrible upheaval and change. Now, if you think about the 19th century at the end of the 19th century, from the beginning, at the end of the 19th century, you have telephones, you have electricity, you have the beginnings of the automobile. None of those are even in the glimmering of the offering in 1801, when wars are fought with muskets, not rifles at a distance. They are fought with the charge, with the bayonet, and horseback, and cannon. I mean, it's a radically different world by the end of that 100-year period. And a lot of this economic change from the agricultural age to the industrial age, which explodes in Europe in the 19th century, uh, creates this tremendous economic dislocation. Um, you get new systems of economy that are proposed. Capitalism, for example, where instead of having a reserved class, now it's whoever makes the most money and however they make it, and they can change professions and they can move around and the free movement of capital leads to a rising tide that lifts all boats, the claim is. Of course, it also leads to massive industry and massive suffering on the part of industrial workers who are working themselves to death, literally, in these factories for starvation wages. Um, you also get radical responses to this capitalist revolution called socialism or communism, which imagines doing away with all of the traditional um, standards and, inst and institutions that keep people in their place, like religion, like social class, like the free market system. Now, when you get those conflicting views and people are caught in the middle suffering on one hand from labor unrest, on the other hand, from the crushing circumstances of actual industrial labor, they're gonna blame somebody. And again, ironically, conveniently, Jews became a convenient source of blame for both 
capitalism and for communism. Uh, because they were successful as industrialists, people thought more so than they deserved, and they were in favor of the new economy and the new changes taking place, and they were interested in undermining traditional society and radicalizing the world into their secular cosmopolitan view of the universe, and therefore they were to blame for global communism at the same time. Again, what were some of the raw data points? Well, there were major market crashes from 1873 to 1877. For example, the Viennese stock market crashed in 1873. There was a lot of over-speculation in railroads. Uh, there was a cornering of the silver market at one point because they decided to demonetize silver in both the American and uh, Prussian economies around the same time. Um, and, and this tremendous dislocation led to a lot of, just like the Great Depression in the 1920s and 30s, led to a lot of scapegoating. Um, and, uh, you know, our own economic dislocations have led to scapegoating of immigrants and, and other people who are seen as the other, whom uh, one can easily blame for economic problems. But even if things had gone smoothly economically, there were a lot of social changes taking place. There's a mass urbanization where the rural peasantry is moving into the cities to work in the factories. And because technological advances on the farm require less manual labor, you know, if you have an iron plow that works a lot better than a wood plow. It takes you a fraction of the time to plow the field. Well, that means you need less people running the plow, which means there's less jobs on the farm. So you wind up going to the city and hoping to make your way there. And it's that raw physical material that provides the muscle mass for the industrial revolution, but also leads to the grinding urban poverty that uh, makes people miserable. Uh, the radical changes in technology are, uh, are undermining traditional values, but also uh, changing conceptions of the world and what's possible. Um, the growth in democratization changes a sense of what's traditional and what value should be in place. Um, you know, even if you have a Prussian democratic system in the 1870s that is allowing for votes to a Bundestag, to a parliament, there's still the Kaiser, which comes from the word Caesar, uh, who is in some ways an emperor of this uh, territory and an elite of you know, the, uh, the uh, aristocracy who don't wanna give up their privileges so much. And some people like that elite and their traditional values or their religious values. And then you get these social Democrats out there who, are, who wanna radically democratize everything. And that's undermining tradition. It's undermining the, the wisdom of the folk, the uh, ancestral um, governing structures that have lasted for centuries um, and modernization you know, uh, affects culture in very powerful and sometimes disconcerting ways. Think about the Impressionists and the revolution in modern art that takes place at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. The idea that you could do a painting that was all fuzzy on purpose because you're getting at the emotions behind it and not just trying to do a verisimilitude picture of the world. But keep in mind, one of the reasons the Impressionists emerge is because of photography. Before photography, you needed painting to depict the world and etchings and printing. But now with photography, you get verisimilitude from a photograph. I don't need to paint that way anymore. Now my painting can do something else. But some people look at that art and say, this is art? Are you kidding me? One of those people, by the way, was an artist who tried to make his way into the official Academy of Art in Vienna in the turn of the 19th, early 20th century, uh, who was born as uh, Adolf uh, Schickelgruber. <laughs> no, his father was Schickelgruber, but he in fact was Adolf Hitler. By the time he was born, his name was Heidler, which became Hitler. He was an art student in Vienna in the early 1900s. And uh, one of his sources of resentment was failing to get into this art academy um, and this led to an ongoing uh, jihad, so to speak, against modernism, and particularly against the art critics, many of whom were Jewish, who were defending this trend in modern art. You may remember hearing about this famous Nazi exhibition of degenerate art, where they took all the um, examples of modern art they hated, and they put them all into one gallery and had an exhibition. It was actually one of the most popular art exhibitions in Germany during the Nazi era, because everybody wanted to go see, but they, you know, they put them in bad corners, they lit them poorly, they, they did as much as they could to make them look bad. And then they had a follow-up exhibition of what the Nazis considered to be good art, which is largely representational and had good values. They got a lot fewer attendees than the degenerate art 
exhibition. But you know, what else is new? But anyways, the point is that this modernization exemplified by modern art was affecting all aspects of culture and cultural norms. I mean, Freud talking out loud about sex and repression and, you know, I mean, th these were things you just didn't do, but now you are because the old traditions, the old religious taboos were declining. And for some people, this was liberating. They loved it. And for other people, it was disconcerting. It was upsetting. There's just something wrong with the world that what I thought to always be true and universal is no longer. Now, by and large, Jews in this period were economically successful. There were Jews working in the urban proletariat for sure. And there were Jews who suffered uh, in uh, tremendous poverty, particularly in Eastern Europe. This is more so Western Europe. But there are some advantages that the Jews had going into this 19th century that made them more successful than one might have expected. This is why it's also called the rise of the Jews period. So what are some of the factors that might have made Jews successful? Well, one example is Jews were largely literate. They could read, they could write. The mass of the peasantry was illiterate. So if you wind up in a city and one person can read and one person can't read, that's a real advantage to the person that can read, that can take an account, that can keep track of things and writing, that can sign their name, that can read a contract, okay? So literacy was a huge advantage that Jewish men in particular, but also many Jewish women had by this period. And once you can read in one alphabet, you can learn another alphabet. It's the concept of literacy that's the tough leap. And again, it's tough to acquire as an adult. Um, a second advantage that Jews had was that they were often in market niches that were valued in capitalism. In feudalism, the middleman was not particularly valued. But in capitalism, that's where you make your money. You know, you're a businessman, you buy low, you sell high. That's how you can become successful. And so the peddlers become the department store owners, become the department store chains, become the bankers. They're able to rise because of uh, the particular niche they were in. They weren't farmers, they weren't schleppers. They were doing something else that in, became much more remunerated during the 19th century. It was much, it paid off much better. Um, also, they were not invested in old industries. They had been kept out of some of the crafts and the guilds, but they were able to get into the railroads, the movies, uh, the newspaper industry, which explodes in the 19th century. Um, art, again, art criticism, that kind of uh, avant-garde thinking. Um, they're now eligible to become professors at universities, which they weren't in the beginning of the 19th century. By the end, they are. And the academic life is a, a, a prominent niche for Jewish life. So they're able to get into these new fields. And sometimes these new fields are very lucrative and successful for them. I mean, again, the, the, the example of the Hollywood movie moguls is perhaps the best one. I also like to think that uh, Jewish success in this period is an example of training with weights. You know, when baseball players go up to the bat and they're in the on deck circle, they usually have weights on their bat to make it a little bit heavier when they're warming up to swing. So when they get to the plate and they swing, the bat feels lighter because they've been training with weights on. That was Jewish economic life in the 1300s, 1400s. They were, they were trying to make a living with weights on, with all the disabilities and limitations they had. Get to the 19th century and between their own secularization, which lets them open their shops on Saturday, and the lifting of restrictions on residence and profession and, uh, and success, now they are ready to run ahead faster because the weights have been lifted and they have that extra drive to, uh, to succeed. There is also the value of a, a close network of community, you know, that uh, some other like uh, Korean grocers, for example, you know, they find a niche and they also patronize their own stores back and forth. Um, so uh, Jewish internal communal cohesiveness helped. Um, and ultimately, the fact that Jews were on the margins um, made it uh, easier for them to be willing to try new things. You know, you think of uh, Freud seeing new ideas in the psyche, Einstein seeing new ideas in science. Um, that's that marginal cultural creativity period. Ultimately, I have to say one of the best Jewish advantages was the fact that they were already living in the cities because the cities became the center of affluence. It wasn't the countryside estates anymore. That's the old money. The new money was in the cities, in these new industries. And so I'll show you some examples of how uh, Jews were so invested in both urbanization and in um, 
in, in their uh, professional development. Um, so here's an example of the occupational distribution of Jews in Europe uh, during this time period. So you have uh, in Poland, just to take one example, industry and trade. The Jewish and non-Jewish population is about comparably represented, about 45% of Jews, 44% of non-Jews are in industry and trade. But look at commerce and credit. 9% of the non-Jews are in commerce and credit. 38% of the Jews are in commerce and credit. Communication and transport, again, the non-Jews overrepresented there. Public service liberal professions, non-Jews more so than the Jews in Poland. Domestic service, some Jews are doing domestic service, but again, a higher proportion of non-Jews are. But let's look at Western Europe. If you go to Germany, for example, industry and trade, well, the Junkers, the aristocracy run most of the factories. 45% of non-Jews are involved in industry and trade, only 18% of Jews. But look at commerce and credit. 50% of Jews are involved in commerce and credit compared to 15% of the non-Jewish population. They're also much underrepresented in commerce and transport, about comparably in the public service and liberal professions. Um, if you look at Hungary, similar kinds of results, way overrepresented uh, in commerce and credit uh, and underrepresented in communications and transport. Um, so you can see this example now in, in, uh, in Canada, it's more evenly comparably distributed, although still commerce and credit use tend to be much more invested in, in professions compared to uh, the non-Jewish population. And again, in a capitalist era, that's where you want it to be in commerce and credit. That's where success was possible. And part of the reason they were so successful is because of their presence in large cities. So let's take a look at a few examples. In Austria, for example, there's 300,000 Jews in Austria in 1923. 200,000 of them live in Vienna. So two thirds of the Jews in Austria are living in Vienna in that period. And I'll point out the total population of Vienna in 1923 was 1 1.9 million people. So Jews were 15% of the total population of Vienna, the capital city of what had been the Austro Hungarian Empire. Now it's just Austria at this period, but this had been a major world city. Or for another example, look at Budapest. Again, almost half of the Jews in Hungary are living in Budapest. And Budapest at the time, this 212,000 represents about 15% of the total population of Budapest. In Paris and in Berlin, again, you see large proportions of the country's Jews are living in these cities. They're not quite as big a percent. They're four to five percent of the population in Paris, Berlin, Prague, or so on. But now look at Warsaw. There's three million Jews in Poland, a little less. Only 10% of them live in Warsaw, 310,000. But the total population of Warsaw in this period is about 900,000. One third of Warsaw was Jewish in 1921. Now, if you were a peasant, who has been kicked off of your farm because you're starving to death and you wind up in a big city and you see all of these professions, these white collar advanced professions have lots of Jews in them and the commerce and credit and the stores you do business with and the businessmen you have to deal with are often Jewish. And you look around you and you see there's this large Jewish population in the city that's been here for a while, that's acclimated and, and seemingly successful, but you're the German, they're the foreigner, Something must be amiss, right? How could this be that those people who should be on the bottom are on top? Now, we have to remember that this period of the 19th century, by and large, is one of tolerance. Even if anti-Semitism starts in this period, the Jews are, success are successful because of the tolerant societies in which they live. In uh, Austria-Hungary, for example, um, in 1781, the same period as the French Revolution, the emperor uh, Yosef in, um, uh, issues an edict of toleration that requires Jews to take last names. It's one of the places where Jews start to get last names and why so many Jewish last names are German by background because of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, but uh, they also um, are able to live in cities. They're able to pursue professions. They have a lot more stability than they did before. And then one of uh, Yosef's descendants, uh, Franz Yosef, who becomes the emperor in 1848, he rules from 1848 to 1916. So it's 
this huge, long, stable reign, and he's largely tolerant of the Jews. Um, in fact, he's opposed to a famous uh, mayor of Vienna, whom uh, I'll talk about in a, uh, I, I should have mentioned earlier. Um, his name is Karl Luger, um, who was the mayor of Vienna from 1897 to 1910. Same period Hitler is living in Vienna, by the way. Luger is a rabid anti-Semite and a populist. So he supports things for working class people and he blames the Jews for all the problems the working class has. Despite the fact that Luger is chosen to be mayor multiple times by the city council, the emperor refuses to endorse him multiple times because of his populism and his anti-Semitism, which Franz Josef objects to. If you talk to any people who had family that grew up or lived under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, under Franz Josef, they loved him because it was a wonderfully stable and tolerant period for the Jews. It's one of the reasons why Vienna grew in Jewish population during this period. Um, and so the Jews were emancipated in the German Empire under uh, Otto von Bismarck and the Kaiser in 1870. And they served very loyally in the German armed forces in World War I. They were very loyal Germans because they had been given the opportunity to be emancipated. So that opportunity of emancipation is also the story of this century as much as the anti-Semitic anti -Semitic story is. Um, you see, one of our problems in connecting the rise of the Jews with anti-Semitism is that people will sometimes accuse you of justifying or defending anti-Semitism. I'm not doing that. I hope you didn't get that message. Um, it is a skewed, evil, cruel view of reality. But sometimes it's based on reality. You know, Again, the question of how many lawyers are Jewish in Berlin at a certain time period could be a demographic fact that becomes sinister in the mind of the anti-Semite. Uh, but anybody who tries to connect the two is sometimes accused of justifying anti-Semitism, which isn't the point at all. It's trying to understand it so we can address it better. So I'll give you just a couple examples of anti-Semitic texts that uh, emerge in this period and a little bit afterwards. So here's one example. Uh, this is the table of contents of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Now, the Protocols is a forgery it is not true. Um, it is not like the minutes of the global Jewish meeting. Um, it uh, was forged by the Russian secret police around 1905, as our best guess. Uh, but it has attained immortality on the internet. You can find it all over the place in all kinds of languages. It uh, is everywhere in the world because you'll see it explains the problems of everywhere in the modern world. So it purports to be the notes of the secret global Jewish conspiracy meeting. So it explains in the preface, who are the elders? It explains their basic doctrine, economic wars. So using the economic dislocation to undermine the establishment. Methods of conquest, notice protocol four, materialism replaced religion. So you undermine the traditional values of work. You undermine the traditional values of religion. Um, your takeover techniques, worldwide wars, is a way for you to make a lot of money selling arms to both sides, but also a way to undermine the traditional governments. Again, look what happens after World War I. The Kaiser falls. The Tsar falls in Russia to communism, no less. And so uh, you can point to that as an anti-Semite and say, look, the wars fomented by the Jewish arms merchants led to the destabilization of our government and the opening for Jewish radicalism. You have to re-educate people. It's not just about um, controlling the economy. You also control the schools, the cultural education. Uh, you uh, impose these values on the youth as well. Um, you control the press, Protocol 12. You distract people with uh, side issues. You suppress those who resist you. You brainwash them. You arrest the opponents. You use your financial program of loans and credit, the power of gold. You see, see how it's all connected here? It's all part of the global plot to undermine society and change things. Well, this is often the debate between those who like things the way things were and those who wanna see the new world do better. Um, it's true, Jews wanted to change things. It's true, Jews were active in the uh, international communist and early Soviet uh, government. Uh, they were overrepresented by their numbers in many of the early Bolshevik uh, party meetings and plannings and so on. Um, they were also successful capitalists. Uh, sometimes above their numbers. They were also poor workers. There's a reason why there was a long Jewish labor tradition too. 
But scientists, I mean, uh, anti-Semites are not scientists. They are not demog demographers doing a rational study of Jewish behavior. They're latching onto the episodes that they want to blame the Jews for. And to give you just one other example of how pernicious this is, in 1988, so now we're you know, looking forward a bit, in 1988, a new organization was formed um, in the West Bank, the occupied West Bank under Israeli occupation um, that called itself uh, Hamas. And uh, it saw itself as part of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which had been founded in Egypt some decades before. Um, and in their Hamas charter, their opening document, which you can look up online in many different places, there are a couple articles that show you how this poison of anti-Semitism, this virus, has spread into the Middle East. In fact, the first copies of the protocols were translated into Arabic and brought in by European priests in the 1920s. Um, the first blood libel in the Middle East takes place in the 1840s, again, um, promulgated by Western educated missionaries. And here, too, this European anti-Semitism has made its way in. So notice some of the accusations here. For a long time, the enemies have been planning skillfully for the achievement of what they have attained. They took into consideration the causes affecting the current of events, the underlying part. They strive to amass great and substantive material wealth, which they devoted to the realization of their dream with their money, they took control of the world media, news agencies, press, publishing houses, broadcasting stations, and others. They stirred revolutions in various parts of the world to achieve their interest. They were behind the French Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and most of the revolutionaries. They formed secret societies like the Freemasons, the Rotary Clubs, and the Lions. I don't know what the Lions ever did anybody, but they, they're often part of the conspiracy theory. In different parts of the world to sabotage societies and achieve Zionist interests. They controlled imperialistic countries and instigated them to colonize many other countries to exploit their... So they blamed the Jews for British and French and German and Russian colonization of the third world. They were behind World War I to destroy the Islamic Caliphate, AKA the Ottoman Empire. They obtained the Balfour Declaration, formed the League of Nations so they could rule the world. They were behind World War II. I mean, look at the, the chutzpah here. They blamed the Jews for World War II, for which they made huge financial gains by trading in armaments and paved the way to establish their state. There is no war going on anywhere without having their finger in it. And then further on in Article 32, World Zionism, through a studied plan and an intelligent strategy, removed one Arab state from, after another from the circle of struggle against Zionism. So Egypt with the Camp David uh, Agreement and so on. Today it is Palestine. Tomorrow it will be one country or another. After Palestine, they aspire to expand from the Nile to the Euphrates. By the way, that Nile to the Euphrates line is actually a quote from the Bible describing Solomon's kingdom. So they didn't make that up. <laughs> That's actually quoting the Bible's imagined uh, maximum territory. When they've digested the region they overtook, they aspire to further expansion. Their plan is embodied in the protocols of the elders of Zion, and their present conduct is the best proof of what we are saying. So that 19th century idea that was blaming the Jews for social dislocation, economic disruption, continues to poison the world and has now been deployed in the Arab-Israeli conflict and between the Islamist uh, um, conflict with Israel via Hamas, Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbollah, and so on. Um, it, is, it is now continuing to uh, spread its tentacles. You know, the anti-Semites imagine the Jew like a spider spreading tentacles all over the world to control it. In fact, it's anti-Semitism that continues to spread tentacles um, around the world and uh, continues to make problems for the Jews because in many ways, the Jews represent modernity. They represent progress. They represent modern culture, secularism, all the things that we humanistic Jews love. <laughs> that's what the Jews represent. And that's exactly why the uh, anti-Semites hate them. Um, and in some cases, they hate them for their foreignness, their otherness. That's why sometimes ultra-Orthodox Jews are the ones who were attacked when there was that, uh, that group of radical Black Hebrews who shot up a supermarket um, in uh, New York. And then there was also the attack on a kosher supermarket in, um, I'm sorry, it was a school in New York. It was a supermarket in Paris. Um, they're attacking Orthodox Jews because they're other, they're foreign, they're different. But the Jews who assimilate, who integrate, who become successfully part of the culture, they're the Trojan horse. They're secret. They're devious. They're sneaking and hiding their way in. Which is it, you might ask? Well, it's not a rational complaint. 
And so unfortunately, if it's not a rational complaint, it doesn't admit of rational solutions. So I'm gonna stop here with this um, and we have our discussion question to look at in a minute, um, but I want to, um, yes, and, and as the comment points out, there were lots of Jews in poor ghettos and there were lots of swaths of Orthodox who reject modernity, but what winds up happening is either you say, those are the good Jews, the backward ones, or the anti-Semite will say, but look how foreign they are. So again, sometimes it's, you look for the excuse to hate those people or to scapegoat them. And you say the Jew is bad no matter what. The Jew is bad if they're foreign and other and clannish and self-separative and believe they're the chosen ones. A lot of anti-Semites jokingly call themselves Goyim because they imagine that the Jews hate them as much as they hate the Jews. And they look at texts about Jewish chosenness and, uh, and other pieces in the Talmud sometimes that are obnoxious. And they say, look, this proves the Jews hate us. So we're justified in hating them. And they'll blame the Orthodox Jews for that too. And their clannishness and their separatism. And the liberal Jews are just hiding the, their evilness by acting like normal people. So you, you get it no matter, there's no, there's no easy way out. 